Hynix Semiconductors plans to shut down its West Eugene factory. That story straight ahead. Fox News at 10 starts right now. You're watching Fox News at 10, Western Oregon's only 10 o'clock news. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for Fox News at 10. I'm Natasha Chugtai. More than 1,100 local employees will soon be out of a job. Hynix Semiconductors is shutting down its large West Eugene plant over the next two months. Alyssa Harrington spoke to some employees. Alyssa, how are they handling it? Well, Natasha, the ones I spoke with say they're not surprised. Some have even been looking for new jobs for weeks. Basically, they tell me this Hynix branch makes memory chips for things like computers and cell phones, but the standard size of those chips has changed, putting these guys out of business. There's been a lot of rumors going around. About Matt Altimus is an employee at the Hynix Semiconductor plant in West Eugene, soon to be a former employee. The company announced Wednesday they'll close this branch, laying off all 1,100 who work there. For me, uh, I feel like I have other options, but um, a lot of people you know, could lose their homes and all kinds of stuff could happen. After meeting with Eugene officials, the CEO released this statement. Our fabrication facility in Eugene, which was originally designed to produce 8-inch wafer memory chips, can no longer remain competitive in an environment where the industry standard is migrating toward a 12-inch wafer chip. Employee Sunny Grover says they got the news Wednesday via email. So what that means is Hynix is not being able to compete with the prices of the competitors that are making the same product on bigger wafers. Can't you just change the product? Uh, if we had $4 billion. Eugene Mayor Kitty Piercy says Hynix is not sure just what they're going to do with this building, but are in contact with several potential partners. A local job loss of 1,100 at such a huge facility might come as a shock to many in the community. But according to these two employees, not to those who worked inside. Were you expecting this? Um, I kind of was. A lot of people were. It's just the nature of the high-tech industry. Things change, things adapt, things develop, and, and then the big players decide whether they're going to change or whether they're going to let go. This Hynix branch has been in Eugene since 1997. Tough time. So, Alyssa, what's next for all the employees? Has Hynix offered them any severance packages? Well, Natasha, that's a good question. And those employees you just saw did tell me they were assured severance packages, but don't know the details at this point. They say the local branch will have several meetings next week to talk about the severance packages and also what they plan to do with that building. Fox News, I'm Alyssa Harrington. Lots of layoffs. What do you think about this story? Email your comments to me at the address on your screen. They could be used in our Talk Back segment that airs on Tuesday nights. New details tonight in the investigation into the death of a toddler. Two-year-old Connor Stegner died at Sacred Heart Medical Center on Monday night after falling from a tricycle at his daycare, operated by Jana Bauman. The Lane County Sheriff's Office says an autopsy performed on the toddler indicates he died from injuries sustained from the fall. They say there's no indication of foul play. And in tonight's follow-up story, Molly Blancett sat down with the woman who was caring for the toddler when he fell. Jan Bauman says it started out just like any other day. So when two and a half year old Connor Stegner fell off his tricycle, she did what she always does when a child gets hurt. So I instantly went over there and grabbed him by the arms and lifted him up and pulled him in tight to me. Not long after, Bauman says Connor took a turn for the worse. His face went pale and he couldn't keep his eyes open. She had a neighbor call 911. Hours later, Connor was dead and Bauman was in shock. And as a matter of fact, I was just going through a bunch of pictures and watching some videos I had of him today, and I miss that little boy so much. She says she did everything right. I called as soon, as soon as he showed a sign of a problem. There was nothing else I could have done. <laughs> and will spend the rest of her life remembering the little life lost. It'll never go away, and I'll never forget it, and it will never be out of my mind. I'm Molly Blancett reporting. 
Again, no charges have been filed against Bauman. The Lane County Sheriff's Office tells us Connor's death was simply a fluke. A six-legged deer attacked by dogs is recovering at a North Georgia animal clinic today. The deer was found Friday near Rome. It had to undergo surgery to repair its wounds. One of its two tails had to be amputated. Veterinarians are now wondering what to do with the animal. They're hesitant about releasing it back into the wild. And a truck carrying bees overturns on a Minnesota freeway. The flatbed was hauling 150 bee hives. Each of those holds 30,000 bees. That's more than four and a half million bees. They swarmed the truck and forced police to shut down the interstate. Special beekeepers were called in to round them all up. The Coast Guard gets its share of mysterious distress calls, but this one is memorable. At 6.13 last evening, a girl who said she was six years old said her boat was floating in the water at the Coast Guard Operations Center. Here's a listen for yourself. That's part of a seven minute long radio conversation the Coast Guard had recorded at their operations center with a girl named Kelsey who said she was six and floating in a boat somewhere in Puget Sound. Using some new technology, the Coast Guard was able to narrow down the location of the call to somewhere south of the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. The distress call came over channel 16, the traditional distress and hailing frequency boaters use. But so far, they are not calling it a hoax. It very well could be, but our policy is to treat all cases as potential or actual distress. And we have to prosecute each case to the fullest until we receive amplifying information that suggests otherwise. Well, could a baseball stadium have a no peanut zone? That's the idea they're tossing around at a Safeco field in Seattle. The stadium will declare two sections a no peanut zone for a few games this summer to make the park safer for people with peanut allergies. After being diagnosed with a life-threatening illness, many patients turn to support groups for emotional help. In today's Health Minute, Judy Fortin tells us what they can expect. <laughs> the thought of opening up and sharing personal details of an illness with strangers may not appeal to everyone, but many people do welcome the reinforcement they offer. I think the major benefit of any support group is for you to be able to say, I'm not alone. Dr. Wendy Lenz says people with diseases and medical conditions who attend support groups suffer less stress and their pain is often diminished. You can be yourself, you can share your experiences, you can learn from others' experience. Doctors are careful to tell patients with life-threatening conditions that support groups won't prolong their lives. We don't tell people that support groups are going to give them a longer life. But what we definitely can tell them is it will help them to live better. Dr. Lenz recommends finding a support group that offers confidentiality, one where you don't have to talk if you don't feel like it, but encourages you to share. Look for a group where attendance is not mandatory. And if you're not feeling supported, she tells patients to leave. For today's Health Minute, I'm Judy Fortin. Well, And still ahead on Fox News at 10, Hurricane Dolly flexes muscle when it slams into the Texas coast. Details coming up, and Kim has your seven-day forecast. Covering Eugene Springfield and all of Western Oregon, this is...